I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 60 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 060. Now, we do have a show for you today that, well, it's important. That's why it was delayed. Now, because of this, I'm not going to do a gun of the show on this episode. We'll push it off another episode. We'll do what was planned for episode 60 on episode 61. And for you Milsurp collectors out there, you might want to stick around for this one. Or for those interested in getting started in Milsurp collecting, you might want to stick around for that one too. Now that I have said that I don't have a gun of the show for this episode, I instead want to use this time to thank everyone who has made this happen. And by this, I mean the passage of open carry and campus carry. I would like to thank Tara Mitchell from the NRA, Alice Tripp from the TSRA, and of course, Charles Cotton from the Texas Firearms Coalition, Texas CHL Forum, the NRA Board of Directors, and I know I'm leaving a lot out, but hey, he's a great guy. He's a great guy to have on our side, and as I have said before, he's welcome to use the podcast, its resources, anytime he feels like it. It's here. It's available to him. Now, additionally, I would like to point out that I had to cut back on guests and all that while uh, the legislature was in session, and that's because I was afraid that I would run the risk of them saying or doing something that would have to be edited out, and then the episode wouldn't make any sense. Now, that I have actually gone out and said that, let me say I did bring only one guest on during the legislative session, and that was Charles Cotton, and we did that so he could explain how to be a statesman and help get legislation passed. Now, with that said, everybody I mentioned earlier, Alice Tripp, Charles Cotton, Tara Mitchia, and I ran them off in alphabetical order, as well as organizations they represent, the NRA and the TSRA, they all deserve our thanks and support, especially now that we have got two flagship bills passed this session. Now, with that said, let me run an audio clip, and then I'm probably going to surprise a few people. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Instead of a instead of our normal bit here where we do listener feedback, because I do have a bunch of it, it's just I really didn't take time to get permission from anybody to use their feedback, and they really didn't say I could. I would like to go ahead, and I would like to say thank you to C.J. Grisham and Open Carry Texas for all the hard work they did on Open Carry and making it an issue over the last eight years. Oh, wait a minute. Even though Open Carry Texas is claiming to be the reason that Open Carry is an issue and that they are the ones who got it to where it is at, they didn't exist in the past when Open Carry actually started to become an issue. Now, in the 2009 legislative session, there was trouble over at OpenCarry.org because there was no Open Carry bill even filed in Texas. And the folks over at OpenCarry.org, they did attack State Representative Debbie Ribble. Blah, Ribble. I mispronounced her name, and I apologize. Debbie Riddle, who requested a bill be drafted by the Texas Legislative Council after making false claims that she re- agreed to file such a bill. Now, the truth of the matter is she agreed to have a bill pulled, meaning have the Legislative Council draft it. Now, that original bill was poorly written, and it would have caused many issues, but that didn't seem to matter to these folks. Now, the issue here is that was in 2009. Open Carry Texas didn't start until around, I don't know, 2013. Now, before that, and I say, I said, you know, eight years, and that's because you know, it's kind of been something since about 2007. Something's been going on in relation to open carry here in Texas. And it wasn't until the 2009 legislature that anything to do with a bill was done. But moving forward to 2011, a bill was introduced and it would have legalized unlicensed, or I'm sorry, it would have legalized licensed open carry. However, many advocates for open carry made false claims that the NRA and or the TSRA were opposed to the bill. In reality, the NRA and the TSRA were active on a number of other issues, and they just simply could not take up the cause of open carry. You know, it's kind of like, well, there's only so much they have in the way of political capital, so much they have in the way of resources, 
And when you have these other issues that people have said, hey, we want this issue and we want it to be your issue or we're going to take our membership elsewhere, guess what? They take it up. Open carry was not one of those issues that their membership wanted them to address at that time. And, well, they didn't. In truth, they weren't opposed to it because I guarantee you, if they had been opposed to it, you would have, they would have uh, let you know they were. Fast forward to 2013, another bill was filed. And this bill was a precursor to the bill we just got filed, or we just got passed. Again, the NRA and the TSRA had a full agenda, and this bill was not part of it. The NRA and the TSRA did not oppose this bill, even though the existing open carry forces were starting to oppose it simply because this bill was not unlicensed carry. Now, the bill did die, and the reason it died was it was never reported out of committee. One of the TSRA's flagship bills, which would become what we now know as the parking lot law, was passed, and the NRA, as well as the TSRA agenda, had an opening for a flagship bill. As a result of that, the NRA and the TSRA began to lay the groundwork for open carry in the 2015 session. Now, it was during the 2013 legislative session that C.J. Grisham was arrested for what Open Carry Texas would later call the walk that started it all. Open Carry Texas officially started life shortly after the end of the 2013 legislative session. Now, in 2014, early in 2014, I started the Open Carry Report podcast. This was the result of an arrest by the Andrews, Texas Police Department of an Andrews, Texas veteran. He was arrested for openly carrying a long gun. Another man would be arrested later by Andrews PD for a similar act after having been given assurances that similar arrests for long gun open carry would not be made. Later, due to the behavior of open carry activists, and, you know, this covers a lot of ground, but because of the behavior of a lot of these open carry activists and the similarity of the name Open Carry Report and Open Carry Texas, it soon became an issue for the podcast to have the name it did. I rebranded the podcast as what we now call the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, and guess what? All the problems, all the he, all the hate email I was getting relating to open carry is gone. I was getting email telling me I needed to stop the marches. I had nothing to do with them. In fact, I reported on one march. Well, I was going to report on two, but the other ones ended just about the time I got there to report on it. And... I had no control over the marches. Everybody thought the Open Carry Report was part of Open Carry Texas, and I couldn't have that. I also started having issues with C.J. Grisham in relation to certain misbehaviors or apparent misbehaviors. Let me put it that way. Certain apparent misbehaviors that uh, were coming from the Open Carry Texas crowd. For the 2015 legislative session, there were several Open Carry bills offered up. Only two were worth any kind of uh, discussion because they were the only two that took any traction. And they were Senate Bill 17, along with its identical House counterpart, HB 910. Now, some of the open carry bills were offered by legislators who had some anti-gun votes in the past. And I really suspect that these bills were traps. I think these legislators were thinking, well, if an open carry bill gets traction, maybe it'll be my bill. And then I can pull my bill at the last minute when it's too late for another one to be filed and open carry is dead. And I really think that may have been what some of these bills were done for. I mean, there was a bill, I forget who who filed it, but it was identical to SB 17 and HB 910. It may not have been 100% identical, but it was so close it wasn't even funny if it wasn't. And I want to say it was by West, and he has a very anti-gun history. Why else would, why would he file an open carry bill? I don't know unless maybe he intend to u- intended to use it as a trap to kill any legislation that would have uh, taken it or taken form with that bill. Okay, so we have the two licensed open carry bills, but what we didn't see was an unlicensed open carry only bill. That bill might have taken more traction than, say, what Open Carry Texas was calling unlicensed, uh, or what they were calling constitutional carry, which is really unlicensed carry. I don't like to call it constitutional carry, and Masada Ayub gives a good explanation of why you shouldn't call it constitutional carry, but I don't like to call it constitutional carry for another reason. This is a right that predates the Constitution. Therefore, if you call it constitutional carry, you're saying the Constitution gives you this right, and this is a right that predates the Constitution. So, really, I can't call it constitutional carry. I can call it unlicensed carry, which is technically what it is, 
but I can't call it constitutional carry. Now, this was also Open Carry Texas' first effort at getting legislation passed, and their bills, well, like I said, they were unlicensed carry bills or constitutional carry, if you listen to how they named them, and that's the common popular name for it. Let me say that. However, the legislation not only died, but they claim credit for the legislation that they tried to kill. They tried to kill a House Bill 910 and Senate Bill 17 because it was licensed carry, and they tried to kill it. They were telling people to oppose licensed carry, and then they were turning around and saying, support unlicensed carry, or support constitutional carry, oppose licensed carry. Then when their bill's obviously dead, what do they do? We support licensed open carry legislation because it's a step forward for gun owners. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You were telling people to oppose it earlier, and now you're claiming credit for it? Or you're telling people to support it because it's a step forward, and then when it passes, you claim credit? I'm sorry, but you really need to sit down and think about what gives you the right to claim credit for something. And that's directed to Open Carry Texas and C.J. Grisham. They cannot claim credit for passing campus carry. Yeah, they testified in favor of the bill. Now, they did also testify in favor for House Bill 910. However, the truth of the matter is that, well, we're lucky their testimony didn't scuttle the bills. They're not as popular as they think they are. The Huffines and Dutton amendments, one reason legislators were suddenly against them, people were reminding them, hey, somebody without a license might carry. And look at this thing that happened in Oklahoma with C.J. Grisham. And Moms Demand Action made a meme poster out of it with Open Carry Texas's own photos. And if you don't know, Open Carry Texas did post a link to the Mimi poster. And I don't think it was Mom's Demand Action. Actually, I think it was one of Bloomberg's other uh, false fronts. But still, that did a lot to damage the Dutton and Huffines Amendment. The fact it was done in a way that was insulting to police officers also helped undo it. And the fact that it was not really needed because there's a Fourth Amendment in the United States Constitution also means it really wasn't needed. Okay, I'm tired of giving you a rant, so I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to follow the show on social media, and then we'll come back and we'll actually talk about Senate Bill 11 and House Bill 910. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Okay, we're back for the final segment of the show, and, well, let's talk about Senate Bill 11. Now, Senate Bill 11 was the campus carry bill, and it did pass. It was watered down, but it passed. And this is important. The reason it's important is, even though it's watered down, it establishes a foundation, it establishes a framework, and more importantly, the watering down was where the president of a college or a university can actually go in and they can, they can make rules restricting concealed carry in certain locations that they feel are sensitive. However, they must. there's two things that are important about this. They cannot have a blanket ban on campus. And they have to report what rules they make to the legislature. And this is important simply because in 2017... We're going to take those reports, we're going to look at those reports, and we're going to decide, are they honoring the intent of the legislation, or are they just using this loophole to go about business as usual? And that's the thing about the local option for the campuses. They have this local option, and they cannot ban it in every building, obviously, because that would be a blanket ban that we have currently, but because it is a local option, it may open the legislation up to a constitutional challenge. And I'm not talking federal constitution. I'm talking about a state constitutional challenge. And that state constitutional challenge would be that the legislature has the authority to regulate the wearing of arms with an eye to preview or with an eye to prevent crime. The, the state constitution does not say, and they can delegate this to a college campus. It does not say colleges have the authority as well. It just says the legislature. Now, the thing about, a, the thing about it is, 
if you get a judge that's pro campus carry, the, the constitutional challenge would probably go well. If you get a judge that's anti constitutional carry, he may take and use the he may take and say, "All right, here's our situation. This is unconstitutional." Everybody smiles because our side thinks they won. Their side knows where it's going, and then he says, "But." Because it's unconstitutional, we have to strike the whole law. And that could be a problem. That could be a big problem. I really don't, I really don't think we'll see a constitutional challenge. This bill barely scraped by, on the skin, by the skin of its teeth, and nobody in their right mind goes to a, nobody, and I do mean nobody in their right mind, takes something to court if they don't absolutely have to. In two years, we go back, we have reports from the campuses themselves where we can say, look, they are trying to ban carry outright. They're saying all students have to meet at this certain building before they come on campus, and then before they leave campus, they have to meet at this building. Oh, and by the way, this building has no concealed carry allowed. They could do that. They could say everybody has to report to a certain building when they come on campus for security reasons, and that building could be off limits to concealed carry. Because of, this, because of the security reasons that people have to report there makes it, I don't know, um, a sensitive location. And that's my biggest fear. My biggest fear is they will find a way to put key facilities as off limits to concealed carry and thereby make it uh, virtually impossible to carry on campus. Now, the campus carry bill also applies to private colleges as well. And this surprised me that this legislation passed with that in it. Now, junior colleges have delayed the implementation. Uh, they have delayed implementation, and they get to wait until some point in 2017. I forget what it is. Part of the legislation specifically says open carry is not permitted as part of it. And the way they're going to put these locations on campus off limits, they're going to have to use a 30 6 sign. And for on-campus purposes, a violation of it is a Class A misdemeanor. Another thing we have to keep in mind is this bill takes effect September 1st of 2016. That means 27 or 2015, it's not in effect. Now, a lot of people may be thinking, okay, if this bill takes effect September 1st of 2016 and this reporting requirement comes in, we only have until January to get the first round of reporting done. And that's okay because now they've had over a year to sit down and figure out what they're going to do and, ironically, those rules will be fresh. They'll be nice and warm and moist and fresh so that when the legislature gets that report, it's going to be, hey, we are doing this. <laughs> and suddenly, everybody's saying, wait a minute, that's not what we wanted you to do. Now, students for concealed carry on campus at first were a little unhappy with the results. However, like I said, this is a major step forward. And... We have the foundation. We have the outside walls. We have the roof. You know, we, all we got to do is we got to worry about building the interior walls and concentrate on wiring the electricity and plumbing the house. Once that's done, we have a house for campus carry. Now, while some individual campuses may go ahead and run with the local control option, the reporting requirements going to kind of keep a lot of them in check because they'll be afraid that this legislature that's coming up might not be very receptive to a very strict running of the rules. They may wait a little while and implement the rules then. But these are academics. They think they can get away with anything they want, so they'll probably try. House Bill 910 was the open carry legislation. And the thing about House Bill 910 is that it started out with the language that SB 17 had when it was sent to the House. Now, there were a number of amendments that were added in the second reading, there was Amendment 13 by Sanford, which changed nursing home to nursing facility. And then Schaefer offered Amendment 18, which was an attempt to reduce the penalty for a 30-06 violation, but a typo prevented it from actually doing what it was supposed to do. As a result, the House amended it in the third reading. Amendment 1 from Burns fixed Amendment 18 from the second reading. Amendment 3 in the third reading is where we ran into trouble. Now, Amendment 3 had language to prevent stops based only on the act of open carrying a weapon. On its surface, that looked good. It was the one amendment that had more votes than all the others. And it was the one amendment that nearly killed the bill. 
When House Bill 910 went to the Senate, the Senate committee stripped the Dutton Amendment from the bill. This is because part of a deal between the leadership in the two houses, and it was because it was seen as a danger to the bill. Now, there were some amendments that were tried in the Senate that, well, during the second reading that were, I'm not going to go through all of them. In fact, I want to talk about some of the failed ones right now. Senate Amendment 1 by Rodriguez would have voided reciprocity for persons who have lost their Texas CHL, meaning, let's take C.J. Grisham. He says he's carrying on a license from another state. However, if this amendment had been tacked on, he wouldn't have had the ability to use another state's license because... Reciprocity would have been voided for persons that do not have a Texas CHL because they have lost it for some reason. Amendment 4 by Zeferini was a local option amendment, which was an opt-in option. Amendment 5 was the same thing, except it was an opt-out. And then Senator Rodriguez offered Amendment 6, which would have gutted the Penal Code Section 30.6. And that was followed by Amendment 8 by Huffines, which, well, it would have proved it. Excuse me, it would have provided for unlicensed carry. And finally, we come to Amendment 12, which was offered by Huffman. Huffman tried to make it a state jail felony for unlicensed carry with the Huffines or the Denton, or not Denton, or the Dutton Amendment language. And that was an interesting twist. It would have escalated the penalty. And why would they think people might do that? I don't know, because a certain representative by the name of Stickland had said, he was encouraging people to, or he had said something that encouraged people to. The organization Katie, or Come and Take It for Gun Rights, they had kind of hinted that people should. I mean, you had you had people that were saying, well, use the Dutton Amendment as a backdoor for unlicensed carry, and it would have been a crime. But then we come to Amendment 9, which was accepted in the set, in the second reading. Oh, I'm sorry, when I was saying the Huffman Amendment, Oh, man, I got my show notes all mixed up. Amendment 12 for the Huff on the Huffman Amendment was not a second-degree felony. It was a state jail felony. This was, her, uh, this was her second attempt at it. Her Amendment 10 was an amendment to Amendment 9, and that one was a uh, second-degree felony amendment. Now, Senate Amendment 9 was supposedly the same language as the Dutton Amendment. However, the Huffines Amendment had different language, not by much. There was like one word that was in there that wasn't in the other, and some of the words were rearranged. It was more grammatically correct, but it was different enough that rather than send the bill to the governor's desk, it kind of scuttled the bill almost. Now, Senate Amendment 10, which was an amendment to Amendment 9, was offered by Huffman, and it would have made it a second-degree felony for unlicensed carry. And it would have also had the effect of causing a CHL who might have had their wallet stolen while they were carrying to become a felon through no action of their own. Now, when the bill went to the House conference vote because the difference between the Dutton and Huffines amendments, it failed. It failed because law enforcement took offense and they lobbied heavily to kill the Huffines amendment. It failed because our anti-gun forces were going out and They were making a big fuss about how people would use it to illegally open carry. All in all, it was not a it was not a pretty sight. And because the conference vote failed, it forced a committee. uh, Well, it forced a conference committee, and the conference committee stripped the Huffines amendment. It went back to both houses. Both houses passed it, and now House Bill 910 is waiting on the governor to sign it. I don't know about you. There's a lot of people saying, well, the NRA was trying to kill the Huffines Amendment. Well, if they were politicking, saying, hey, don't vote for it, keep in mind they were trying to preserve a deal to get both campus carry and open carry passed without any kind of bad bad amendments that being added. And if it was a case of them trying to get it killed, guess what? There was no need for the amendment anyway. When the Without the Huffines Amendment, it could have went back to the House. The House could have said, well, it's different. We're going to have a concurrence vote. Concurrence vote says, hey, it's good, and it goes to the governor. But instead, we had a concurrence vote that failed, went to a conference committee, which fortunately was done quickly, and we got a vote back quickly. So 
We didn't lose campus carry, although I'm certain some of the amendments would not have passed if they would not have been added on if we had been given, if, you know, they, if possibly the Huffines amendment hadn't been there. I'm certain we could have moved it forward a little bit better. But anyways, though, I'm going to run another audio clip and then I'm going to see why I keep wanting to sneeze. In other words, I want to go take care of this uh, sinus issue. I've done a lot of lawn mowing the last mm, three or four days. And while this audio clip's playing, I'm going to take some sinus medicine and hopefully I'll pause the recorder, come back, and not be trying to move away from the mic and avoid a sneeze again. With that said, here's how to get in touch with me. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, folks, we're here for the news segment. It's only going to be one little round, so or we're going to have three stories. So it's going to be our usual three-story news segment, but I don't want I don't want people to think that this show is buying into the anti-police, anti-law enforcement uh, rigmarole that's going around the country. Now, in Wolfworth, Texas, which is just outside of Lubbock, a woman surrendered to the police after a standoff with them that stemmed from the woman shooting a man. Now, the man, the man that was the victim, he was shot through at the door of the woman's house after knocking on the door and identifying himself in an effort to check on the woman. The man was treated by EMS at the scene, and he refused further treatment. In other words, it's just a grazed, he has just grazed or debris from the bullet going through the door, wounded him. However, incidents like this is where officers shine. You have, a, you have a party that's barricaded in their house. They have shot at somebody that's walked up to the door. They're obviously not mentally stable. And what are you going to do? Leave them alone and hope they don't come over to your house? No. You're going to want the police there to take care of them. So why, why do you... Why do you have people out there just anti-cop? I'll tell you why. Because these people view the cops as the enemy because they're doing something that's either morally or legally uh, ambiguous. Let's leave it at that. However, I want to say to the Lubbock County Sheriff's Office and to the Wolf Worth Police Department, good job on ending the standoff without anybody being shot other than the initial victim. And thank you for your service. And we do have two political stories I want to touch on. And the first one is a tax, on, a, a tax, good Lord, a tax on the licensed open carry law have already started, even though the legislation does not go into effect for at least, or for around another seven months. Now, the article implies that the legislation will be applied in a racist manner, and their evidence is a video that was recorded in what appears to be two different states, neither of which is Texas, and you have two people in environments that are stopped by different officers and they're treated differently. I don't know about you, but you'd really try to find two environments that are as close to the same as possible. And then you try to use the same officer for both stops. Too many factors are different in these two videos to say it was race. I mean, the most obvious thing that's different is the race of the people being stopped while open carrying, but there's too many other factors at play. But this is the kind of attack that we can expect on the uh, licensed open carry law no matter what happens. And that's because the anti-gun crowd is going nuts trying to kill it. It's not, even a, it's not even gone into law. It hasn't even been signed by the governor as I'm recording this. And they're still attacking it. And then moving on, the Dallas Morning News has an article where they cover campus carry. Now, campus carry passed both houses, and it's waiting on the governor's signature as well. But... This particular bill is a compromise where university presidents can implement rules that prevent concealed carry in some, but not all, locations. However, they may not implement a complete ban. And I find it funny, all this all this uh, whining and moaning and carrying on, blood in the streets, and, well, we're not going to see a problem. Funny how that works. Anyways, I want to wrap this show up because my head's about to explode, even though I've taken sinus medicine. Uh, I'm feeling the strain, so I'm going to run the sign-off music, and then I'll, and the show will be over. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. 
Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Earlier, I said that the concealed carry bill doesn't take, uh, or the open carry bill doesn't take effect for seven months. Somehow, I was counting uh, July twice in there, so it's actually six months. The moral of that story: Don't podcast when your head's about to explode from your sinuses. Please stay safe and carry responsibly.